In this first episode of the Waboripedia, the figure behind the Yank interview series, where we interview respected Horishi from all around the world, we will be sitting down with London Slate, famous Nagasaki prefecture based Horishi, known for the power of his compositions and their distinctively traditional look. London has traveled all around the world, won many awards, and impacted the lives of many with his work. Join me as we sit down with London Slade and learn more about the figure behind the ink. London, thank you very much for, for joining us. The man, the legend, thank you for making the time. Uh, you know, you were the first Urishi that we interviewed for the figure behind the ink series and Instagram, and now you're the first that we're actually doing the figure behind the ink uh, episode here in YouTube and, and Spotify. So thank you very much, my friend, for, for joining. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. You're joining us from, from Nagasaki Prefecture. Is that right? Yes. Uh, currently, I am in a uh, city called Sasebo. Um, it's kind of like a port town for Nagasaki Prefecture. Um, yeah. Been tattooing out here for... I just got back in September, but I started at this studio like four years ago, uh, just before the pandemic. Awesome. Awesome. We'll get, we'll get to the nice, uh, little bits of it later on, but you know what, why don't we just get started and why don't you tell us, how did you get started with Wabori or traditional Japanese tattooing? Um, okay. So the first and foremost thing that I'm going to say is, um, so I started tattooing, uh, as a whole, uh, almost 19 years ago. Um, I started really young, um, you know, I was into punk rock and, and whatever, and I was living in Toronto at the time, uh, Toronto, Canada. Um, so it was really kind of good for the time. But in regards to tattooing, most of what I was seeing was either George Clooney, Dusk Till Dawn, Tribal, you know, from the fingertips all the way up the neck, or um, what, what I had learned at that time to be Japanese, which was a bunch of, every color of the rainbow uh koi fish that you know looked like the dicks and um and lots of you know bright blue backgrounds and stuff and so i remember probably for the first half of my career uh just going on about how much i never wanted to do uh japanese tattooing uh wabori tattooing um but one of the things that always kind of like was in the back of my head is I knew that this was just what I was being shown. This is what I was just being seen because you'd get little glimpses of what real Wabori tattooing was right from Japan. Um, when I was a kid, I was really into National Geographic magazine and I was really in love with how uh, foreign Japan looked in a lot of these magazines seeing a lot of the mountains, uh, seeing a lot of the countryside, seeing, you know, like Onsen town and then, you know, Kyoto, stuff like that. And I do remember coming across seeing photos of like, you know, tattooed Yakuza and, you know, bathhouses and stuff like that. And again, it would just be little glimpses of this that just kind of, I guess, subconsciously stayed with me throughout the years. And so I think it was yeah, probably about halfway almost through my career. And I was like, you know what? Like, I know this exists. I've been tattooing long enough. I've met a lot of people, you know, I've traveled a bit. I was like, I just, I'm just going to start asking the who's who uh, in, you know, in Canada, at least at that time, if they knew anybody, if there was like something in the underground, you know, a word, uh, word and whisper in the wind. And um, so I talked to... Um, this uh one really good uh, friend of mine um who so happened to have a really good relationship with a japanese uh Horishi family uh here in japan and he was very like very just so in telling me that there was zero like wabori tattooing tibori tattooing specifically is what i was looking for to get done on my own body i wanted to get uh, my back finally done and uh what ended up happening was like a couple of years maybe like i don't even 
remember. It's a little hazy, but it, it was a bit. And he ended up uh, calling me, uh, my friend, and was like, uh, hey, are you still wanting to get uh, your back tattooed? I'm like, oh, I'd, yeah, of course. And um, he had said, well, I have this like little Japanese guy come into my studio to do a guest spot. You should talk to him. And so uh, eventually I did get to meet up with the Orishi. I was very adamant in not choosing my design. Um, I really felt that at that time I knew nothing of Japanese tattooing. And it would be best if it was chosen for me and just said, you know, like, hey, maybe get to know me a little bit and kind of pick something that would work well for me. Um, not even really realizing that this was the most traditional format of, uh, of Wabori Tatsumi. And um, so I ended up meeting up with the artist and, you know, just like in, you know, those old, you know, tattoo movies from Japan, he rolls out, you know, this painting and he's like, this is what you're going to get, which um, we'll end up kind of circling back to this, I think, by the end. Um, but he was like, hey, you know what this is, right? And I, I had no clue what I was looking at. But I, you know, I didn't want to look like a chump. So I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I know what this is. And uh, what ends up happening is uh, I get the tattoo. I fall in love with the experience. Uh, you know, um, my first time with Sporty, uh, especially having so many uh, machine tattoos, um, one, you know, majority of people will say the same thing to Sporty hurts drastically less than machine. And um, so, of course, you know, my first couple hours in my first experience, I was like, wow, this saying like i'll come back tomorrow like you know you got time tomorrow let's do more of this and like i'm gonna hit this hard and, you know eventually my back turned into let's work on my front and eventually that turned into like let's expand on my leg but you know at the end of the day it's still needles going and skin and it was still hurting and i think because of that it really had a different sense as a whole like i felt and it's still even more so strongly feel that wabori tattooing, especially when we're looking at tibori and the most traditional methods of it, um, the whole experience is a lot different than getting a regular tattoo. I feel so. Yeah, I got uh, I got into it just by chance and by luck. And uh, when I got into it, I hit the ground running. Um, I asked the same tattooer if he would teach me, and uh, of course, he said no nope immediately. Uh, he spoke very little English, but he said no immediately. Um, in my head, I thought maybe he just wasn't understanding me. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn Japanese. Like, I'm going to learn Japanese language. And, like, maybe I'll ask him, like, and, uh, and then, like, a couple months later, he ends up seeing me and I'm, I'm you know, studying my Japanese. So like, why, why are you trying to learn this? Oh, don't worry. Like, I have a question I'm going to ask you later. Like, I'm not ready to ask you yet. And uh, Orishi is very smart, I think. And uh, they're very in tune without knowing what's actually going on. And um, yeah, it was just kind of like, it ended up kind of being a fizzle into it. And then there was that one moment where um, when I started coming to Japan, uh, I started coming to pursue further learning as well as to uh, further work on my own like bodysuit. It, um, that's, that's when it started getting really like heavy duty and really serious and like actually, you know, learning how this works. So, you know, not just being, you know, some dickhead with a stick and, you know, random needles going at it. And, um, yeah, it was just like, I got lucky and I, I really, I, I went and first into it, hit the ground running, whatever you want to say. It was just something I fell in love with immediately. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. I actually hit on a couple of points that I do want to bring up, uh, but actually just following the the flow of the conversation. So if you can just tell us like what's the body and then I think I already know, right? Based on what, what, what you're telling me, but one, what is the body? And then two, uh, why did you choose to, to follow uh, doing the body tattoos? So first off, the word Kibori is a Japanese word. Uh, te meaning hands, body to car. Um, so te body is uh, tattooing that is uh, strictly done by hand. Um, everybody's variation of it is different. I know that there are some bodishi that will choose to line with tattoo machines or, um, you know, if we look at like 
you know, Gishu Horihide, um, Gishu Horihide, uh, right up to the point of his retirement, he was using um, mostly Tibori to line, but then would fill in with like machine. Um, so everybody's version of it is going to be a little bit different, but it involves in one way, shape, or form um, doing the tattoo without any electricity, without any machine guidance. It's all driven by hand. Um, so that's that's immediately going to be the first difference um the next one is is i would say so everyone says that tibori is you know they're going to say oh tibori from the customer's perspective tibori is going to be slower than machine because it's done by hand so it's going to be slower and in one aspect the customer is not wrong um for sure there's going to be that difference because of such but then i also know that there's like a lot of carvers um sometimes they'll give you bullshit and they'll they'll say like oh well no it's about the same and they'll explain like uh you know one of my tibori needles has like triple quadruple you know 50 million times more tattoo needles than the average you know machine tattoo needle and that's why it's faster but like for my own perspective I am uh, slower with Tibori than I am with machine. However, I am in a really good tempo with my Tibori to a point where it makes me faster than most tattooers with a machine. Um, so it varies between artist to artist, technique to technique, but I think most importantly, design. So for myself making Tibori designs, um, I'm trying to imitate more so uh, Japan's, I would say, Taisho era. So most of what Western audiences are going to see of Japanese tattooing is going to be kind of like that Showa era. Yeah. So 70s, 80s, and so on. And so this is why, like, you know, if you see just a regular tattooer, one that not, not necessarily specializes in Japanese tattooing, they're going to make their backgrounds and they're going to be like, okay, uh, on your mask and then like a bunch of little black bars. That black bar kind of look is someone who's referencing what they're seeing, you know, Google, what have you, of Japanese tattoos, which is usually, again, a lot of that Showa kind of era. Um, for me making Tibori, I'm trying to make it 100%. I'm trying to do so Tibori, where it's lining, shading, everything all by hand. So because of this, the designs are going to be prevalent of the time of the era of Japan where they didn't have so much machine influence. And so the designs are going to be a little bit more crude, a little bit more simple. Backgrounds are going to be more simple. Uh, instead of doing an area like this where it's going to have, you know, four or five bars of, you know, background, it's going to be one consolidated area that's going to have just a really strong gradation. So everybody's kind of speed is going to be different I would say because of design. Um, Tibori heals much faster than machine. Um, Tibori is supposed to heal much faster than machine because it impacts the skin differently. Um, the different effects that um, you can achieve through Tibori, the, uh, through different techniques, um, this will also determine how fast or how slow the tattoo settles. Um, the big one that I kind of explain to a lot of my customers but they're going to find as a difference between machine tattoos and Tibori tattoos is the Tibori is going to heal faster. So you're not going to have much flakes. You're not going to have much scabs or anything like that. And it'll heal really quick compared to the machine. But the settling into the skin is going to take drastically longer. So you might find that even though your tattoo has been healed for a month, you're probably still itchy. Um, you might still have like a shininess to your skin. Um, stuff like that but tibori is meant to uh kind of disperse into the skin which is what helps give it its longevity versus a machine it's just kind of a quick insertion um you know it's it's right there and it's going to kind of lighten up as time goes by versus that spread tibori is meant for that spread over time and so this is why like i will often tell people it's not that your colors are going to get brighter. It's not that, you know, your blacks are going to get blacker. It's that everything's going to get stronger 
as it starts spreading into the skin. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I know that, that makes total sense. And in fact, you know, as you were talking about Taisho era, uh, style sort of tattoos and, and the power, like that's, you know, when I think about London Slade, that's precisely what I think about, right? Powerful tattoos. It's just like the first word that comes to mind. I think the first time I saw one of your tattoos, I'm like, oh my God, look at this. This is amazing. Right. And it looks so old school, sounds kind of crude. But, you know, it looks so traditional. I guess that's the more romantic way to put it. It looks so traditional. It looks so powerful. So it's, it was, you know, it makes a lot of sense, everything that you're saying. And then when people actually see your work, of course, they're going to be blown away by by the results of that. Yeah. So that's that's awesome. And let me ask you this. Do you have a favorite subject, the tattoo? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so... I will usually tell most of any prospective customers, like, because I, I'll do interview process. Um, I try to ask uh, my customers a little bit about themselves personally. Um, all of the questions that I ask, they all vary between person to person. I kind of just want to go with the flow, try to kind of figure out the, the character that is who I'm about to tattoo. Mm -hmm. um, but I tell everybody the same thing is I usually am going to gravitate more towards, I would say, kind of like roughneck uh, anti-heroes. I really love the stories behind, you know, these bad guys with good arts. Um, you know, talking about characters. Like, like I really want to talk to, like, Ishikawa Goma, um, who was like, you know, basically a famous thief. Um, I thought that story was just absolutely cool. Like, I'm actually getting goosebumps thinking uh, <laughs> about Yusko. Um, You know, I love the uh, story of Sweet Coden. I love a lot of what's behind that. Um, I really like it's funny because, again, there'll be a lot of like customers that uh, like will come to me and they'll be like, oh, I want like the samurai. They're so strong, they're so this, they're so that. But for me, I think like there's more honor in being human. And that's why I like a lot of these rough around the edges kind of characters and stories. And usually when you're drawing these kind of motifs, you're able to get more simpli like simplicity. And through the simplicity, you will get the strength. Because if you're sitting there, for instance, like doing a samurai, you have to draw like all the armor. You have to, you know, stay half like a uh, different common. You know, you have to uh, draw that. So much detail in such a you know an area versus like you know when you have you know like a hero of street code and yeah we can sit there and we can talk about all the tattoos and all the detail that goes behind that but it's still kind of like a different effect so from a technical perspective yeah a lot of these rough net kind of stories tattoo very well i i think and then the stories behind them that's like that's why you get a jack because of the cool stories behind it and those stories like i just think are the most human thing you know uh and that's that's what makes them so great awesome yeah no exactly like when you think about the like the original if you want to put it that way like edo period uh tattoos right they would mostly be or not mostly but very popularly like suikodan tattoos right so the outlaws right that, that was the thing to get right because you're just so powerful and and the people can relate to them, right? Even if they're a goody two shoes type of guy, everyone has their own dark side, sort of, so to speak, right? So they can relate to to these figures. So that that makes a lot of sense. Um, so in fact, kind of, kind of continuing in that vein, you know, we talked about the the figures and and your composition style, how it's so powerful. But maybe if you can just expand more on, I don't know, about your colors. Uh, how your, your composition style overall? I think you already mentioned like the Taisho era, and and what makes them so powerful? Because you know sometimes I look at all these different Orishi, right? Uh, many of them have uh, their own style and they're distinctive. You can look and you can say, oh, this is this guy, this is this is that guy, right? And you know I think fortunately uh, you're one of those guys. I would say you know you, you, somebody looks at one of your tattoos and they can tell, oh my god, that's that's lot in the slate, right? And it's very powerful. So I'm just wondering, like, what's what goes into your thought process and 
what influences your like your color choosing and, and your compos composition style? So <clears throat> obviously there's going to be influence from the generations before. Um, so I was taught by somebody who um, kind of went with that, again, that old school palette of, you know, Shido, uh, brown, and, uh, and black. And I, you know, I still get to see remnants, even in person, you know, being in Japan, I get to see remnants of the Showa period of Tatsumi. And I always found it just didn't have as much impact. And I understand it being a tattooer and like, you know, when you get, for instance, just doing regular kind of tattooing, when you have a new set of color come out, you're like, oh, I got to use every color that's in the set. I got to try it out. Or like if you get a new machine, you're like, oh, I'm going to make this do everything I want, you know? And so that's what I was seeing with some of these Showa era tattoos is it's like, cool, they're powerful because there's all these colors, but the readability changes because seeing from far away, you're going to see, wow, like that's a lot going on and your eyes aren't really putting together the image the same way um, versus what I was seeing from who taught me where I just found that there was a little bit more of a strength. Now, the big one is, is I spent the first part of learning like this is what Japanese tattooing is by studying only uh, like paintings from uh, people from one area of Japan and that's the Chibu area the Chibu region of Japan so looking at a lot of like tattooers from Gifu uh, Fukui, uh, Fukui I, I gotta make sure I, like Fukui is in Chibu area but like a lot of this area I studied a lot of Gifu uh, tattoo artists so Thinking about guys like Horikashi, for instance. Horikashi mm. uses a lot of color, but his strength comes through making bigger designs and really bold designs. So I think about if I was to take some of these great tattoos and everything that I love about them, either in the modern sense or in historical sense, um, looking backwards at the different time eras of Japanese tattooing, what do I think is the best combination? So for me, I liked looking more so at that classic, um, you know, like Taisho era photographs. And it's not even just that. It's like even when we look at uh, books that were published in the 70s showing full body suits that are like, you know, 40 years old, looking at those tattoos as well and kind of studying what's really great and really classic about them. I think it starts with the use of and most tattooers, Japanese, modern, I know, um, foreign, and, and looking at their tattoos, they're always sitting there trying to fight with what's the blackest black that they can use. When realistically, they should be looking at, I feel, well, that's the best black in regards to the person's skin. So anytime I meet a lot of tattooers, I usually ask them, like, hey, what kind of black are you using? And do you mind if I see how it looks? being your customer because oftentimes what I'll try to do is incorporate traditional sumi black ink that you know I'll grind by hand with modern blacks as well so the modern blacks at their 100% is going to be stronger than sumi usually at its 100% and because you're getting something that's from like a machine you're going to get different options in regards to kind of like a gloss matte and then sumi i find is usually kind of like a matte finish is what it looks like in the skin so i can achieve different effects from that for me because i minimized my color palette i was able to pay attention to black a lot more and this also includes sumi so i find most orishi will use usually like maybe one or two different kinds of sumi but like i have like a whole room dedicated to just all the different types of sumi that you know i've bought over the years or i've tried over the years stuff like that because sumi black when you when you minimize your color palette your eyes want to see more color and so when you take something like sumi which is made from different ash from different plants when you wash it out and you make it really thin 
you can achieve like different color tones, like effects with it. So like maybe I'll go and I'll do my backgrounds. I'll use like, uh, like a green kind of black, but then I'll go and I'll do foregrounds and maybe I'll use like kind of a purpley. This will help play with what colors, the little bit of color that I and then the other thing is too, is depending on that black, when I go and I mix it into my shoe, I can change the effect of the brown that I use. So it's like different things like that. If I was to say like there was any reason why my stuff had any bit of power to it, I think it would just be because like, again, I, I would give all credit to the use of black. Um, I, I love learning about the different black inks, you know. It's awesome. That's awesome. That's very interesting. You know, when you mentioned that you have a whole arsenal of uh, different Sumi ink and, and blacks, right? I, I never really thought about that. I know some people swear by just one Sumi uh, stick from one particular vendor, right? And that's what they tout and they they promote. Uh, but then it's refreshing to hear, hey, I have this whole arsenal of blacks that I've tested and I know how they evolve through through the years, right? So that's I think that's very cool. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, when you look at the blacks over the years, I think something that people uh, notice is, or, or people might hear, especially if they're in Japan, right, is how the black turns kind of like a bluish hue or a brownish hue. And perhaps that's something that people over here in the West might not understand, right? Maybe it has to do with, with the machine ink. I don't know. I don't know what I'm what I'm talking about here. But uh, I know I've heard that a lot with the Sumi inks. And based on what you're saying, too, I think it makes a lot of sense how, um, you know, the impact and, and the different nuanced colors come through, even though technically you could say at the eye level, it's, it's just a black, right? But that's awesome. That's, yeah. If, if I may, like, here's the big one too, though. Like, so I'll use bamboo as a really good example. So if bamboo is grass, you know, it's an, it's an organic material. Bamboo on one side of Japan is going to grow differently than bamboo on the other side of Japan. So um, here, you know, I'm living in Nagasaki Prefecture, and it's like sweltering hot, usually really dry, but it's by the ocean. So, you know, you're going to have all these different things that are going to affect the area. Versus like when I was living in Sendai, you know, it's it, not as hot, more humid, um, you know, there's a lot more wind, stuff like that. So it's going to affect how bamboo grows. Now, when we look even at skin, we can't look anymore at skin as if it's like by race. We can't, we can't go like, oh, here's a Japanese person. Here's uh, someone of African descent. Here's someone of Scottish descent. We, we can't look at it like black, white, you know, Asian, we can't do that anymore because even living in one country where predominantly everyone is Japanese, I sit here and I can tell you when I come to the Kyushu region and I see all the Japanese people here, you know, they're like super dark in comparison to someone who's out in like Hokkaido, who's going to be really more pale skin. So when we think about how just where a person is and how it can affect, uh, you know, down to the levels of how their, their skin is. And I don't mean like dark to light. I mean more in regards to tint. You know, some people are going to be more yellowish. Some people are going to be more greenish, more reddish, more brownish. And so you need to start thinking about the base of pigments. So if we, if we look at like old school American tattooing and we think about like, these 80 year old guys that we see today and they're showing us their, you know, crappy little blob from like however many years ago and all that's remaining is a black and it, we, we can usually sit there and think, oh yeah, it's like a blue. It's like a green. And it's because back in American history, we were using basically the same kind of thing, a calligraphy ink. And that calligraphy ink is either going to have you know, a blue hue to it, and that's what makes it black, or it's going to be stronger to the green. And so when we start thinking about this in relation to skin types, and then the fact that we have even more options to pull from it, you'll get even better from it. So somebody from Kyushu, I'm going to be more prone to use like green blacks 
which are going to age and settle really well with that darker, more tanned, kind of like yellowy, like undertone than if it was somebody in Hokkaido who's going to be a lot more pale. And, you know, for them, I'm going to get a better effect by using a blue black, which is going to have a higher contrast against, you know, pale skin. And so that's, that's kind of where, you know, like even then, like I would say, if you look at somebody from Barbados versus somebody from Africa versus somebody from Jamaica, there's again, these underlying tones in which paying attention to the blacks will really kind of, I don't know, you, you can take it to the next level. And it's all stuff that like, you'll never be able to photograph. It's stuff you can only really see in person, but it's subliminally there. Even if you're not picking up on it, it's subliminally there. That's awesome. I mean, that's awesome. That's also awesome to hear just, I mean, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, wow, you know, this guy's really loving and thinking through his craft, right? Because I think many people, you know, maybe even veterans or, or at least people coming into tattooing, they, they don't think about this, this sort of stuff, right? Maybe they'll pick a, like you were saying, right? The latest ink, the latest black or whatever, right? And they just... They're just curious or interested in using the latest colors, but they're not thinking about, okay, how does this actually evolve in my client's no. skin, right? To, to have that lasting impact. So that's, that's really refreshing and, and really cool to hear. All right, London. So I think what we're going to do next, why don't we just look through some of your works and if there's something you can share about them, whatever you want to share about them, I think that'd be awesome for for the audience to, to hear. So I'm going to start sharing now. Let me do this. Oh. oh, right. You should be able to see one of yes. your works right there. This soul thing? Ugh. Trash. <laughs> it's all trash. Um, okay, so uh, this is um, a bodysuit of one of Kuniyoshi's uh, renditions of Heroes of Street Court character. Uh, I'm going to bastardize the name always, but Ensei Hiroshi. And um, this was a really great experience. This would uh, be one of my more favorite renditions of this character. Uh, for those who might not know the story, what's depicted here is basically a scene from a wrestling match that he's having. Um, here, I wanted to try and do something a little bit different with how I did the tattoos. Um, and in this case, because I really wanted to kind of showcase that, like the main image is done to body only. It's all only done by hand. Um, but I wanted to have a different kind of look, like I was saying with the tattoos. And so for this case, um, I was kind of doing um, like what I would call like punk rock Tibori B with how I did most of the shading in the tattoo figures backgrounds. Um, so what that basically involved was doing like, uh, I don't know, a Western version of Shamisen body where, you know, you're a little closer down at the base and you're kind of doing a, there I call it stick and rope. Um, but I felt by doing this, I would have, a, a, you know, a really cool way to exploit the sumi that I was using, um, because I would hit the skin just so it would kind of, um, almost kind of spread a little bit into the skin and help me exploit the fact that I was using kind of like a bluey tinted, uh, sumi black. Uh, which would imitate kind of like that old UTOA look a little bit. Um, in this piece here, um, I'm using green. Um, this would be a case of me trying to find kind of like a middle ground with my customer. My customer was really open for more color and was like almost begging me to, to use green. Um, for this bodysuit as whole to kind of accommodate with back tattoo here um i end up doing uh botaro gaku body which is uh like peony with uh just like some nice backgrounds i wanted to keep it more simplified um and give all my attention to just the back tattoo 
Um, and by choosing Wokong Gakugori, it almost is a nice playoff of the black tattoo because uh, this character, um, his tattoos are supposed to be Katajishi Wokong. And um, it's just kind of like, dare I sound like an uneducated person here, but tattoo inception, you know, conception, where my customers' tattoos have a lot of botong and botong got kokori on, you know, like limbs. So does uh, this sweet golden character. Uh, yeah, this was a really fun tattoo to make. There's a lot of crazy little details that I ended up doing in. Uh, like in one, the tattoos, and then two, in uh, the clothing. Um, and then also, um, you know, because he's holding the pillar with fabrics on it, um, in the fabrics as well. That was all done by him. Oh, this is awesome. This is one of my favorite uh, of your works because it's just so powerful. And for those that are just listening, you know, you have clouds, you have stone, you have, of course, uh, this uh, Roshi Se character, and then the tattoos. Like London mentioned, right? The Kara JC and the and the peonies, but and they're just so well done. So I'm just being blown away by well, well first is you know how, how good you are at drawing it on the skin, right? I I really love the tattoo on the tattoo, right? It looks it looks fantastic, and then of course your overall uh, mastery, just just of the whole process with how the colors are, are blended in. I also you know initially. Uh, before you mention anything about the green, I was thinking, oh, there, there's some green in here, right? Uh, but it looks good. And so now that you mention it, now it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, oh, there, there's some green in there. He, this is why, right? Just compromising with the with the client. And I think the end result is, is still spectacular, right? Um, really, I, I know I'm saying a lot, but it's one of my favorite pieces, just how, how, how good it looks. And also going back to... Um, your comments about the older school style of tattoos, right? You know, I look at this one, maybe the green, right? It's, it's the exception, but overall, it really does look like old school, traditional Japanese, which I, which I really like, right? Thank cool. you. All right. So let me move on to the second picture I have here. Two. So I talk about this guy every day almost. Um, so I'm before I even address the tattoo, I'm going to address the person. Um, this is a 22 year old kid, and he was super, super intelligent about how he wanted to go about doing this. So. When I started tattooing this bodysuit, I started with just the one point tattoo on um, his one forearm. And I could tell, like, this uh, this person's very outgoing. And I could tell that from the moment I met him. And I could tell he kind of wanted to reflect that in tattoos. But I felt maybe was going wrong about it. And what this was, was a um, young guy, and he started by getting like a whole bunch of like little things here and there. And they were just really jumbled up. And he, I could just tell he wasn't really getting what he wanted out of it. So I told him, I said like, listen, kid, because younger people are more prone, I feel, to take suggestion if you keep it real with them. And so I told him, I was like, listen, kid, like, if you want a really cool experience, like, I'll tell you what, try this out. We'll do like a one point tattoo. And uh, I promise you'll fall in love. So we did. And from doing this one point tattoo, he was like, I want to finish my like one sleeve. He had like a bunch of, again, like just little kind of one point tattoos on that arm. And so we did a snake on one of his sleeves. Uh, you can actually see him on one of his arms. You can very visibly see uh, a snake on the back of the arm there towards the elbow. Um, but from doing that one sleep, he wanted to go to the other sleep. And I said, okay, well, here's another kind of like rare thing for younger people is saying like, hey, you should have like a perfect matching set. And so we did on the other sleep, we started making a snake. 
And around this time, starting the other sleeve, what happened was, is he was actually getting introduced to some of my other customers, um, and started kind of seeing like this, I don't know, I like to try to do like this underground kind of vibe to, to how I run my studio. And, um, he started seeing some like the, you know, bigger, uh, tattoos and was like, Hey, do you think we could start my back? And I said, yeah, man, like not a problem. And, uh, from there we, uh, we did this, this is Jiraiya, um, and Jiraiya fighting basically Orochimaru, like, you know, you see the big snake there works really well with the snakes. Um, this is probably that one tattoo that I would say is like the most perfectly balanced body suit. And I like for that, I want to be able to sit there and take pride, but I owe a lot to it to, uh, my customers, like openness and willingness to just take, uh, my follow. So in this suit, yeah, we see Jiraiya in the back. Um, the, you know, we have the uh, double dragons uh, as the sleeve. Um, on his front, this is a Donburi suit. So on his front, we have uh, a big frog. Um, you know, into Jiraiya's powers. Um, and then on one of the thighs, we also did uh, like Tsunade's slug. Um, and then just kind of showing, I don't know, I felt it was like a nice good balance of showing um, kind of like uh, achieving just this this grand battle. This is why I ended up doing like Oi, because uh, again, I wanted to keep the theme of Momiji throughout the uh, entirety of uh, the bodysuit. Um, this is mostly done by handhold. Uh, so backgrounds, shading, color, everything by hand only uh, is what you're seeing here. Um, the only one I think I used a machine for was that that first initial tattoo, and it was just yeah. to do the line. Uh, this was oh. made by. Oh, so oh, this is awesome, and like you said, you know, I, I look at it, and it, it just flows so well, like. And, and also for those who know a little bit more about Japanese tattooing, right? You see from like sort of from the ground up, you have the the water at the bottom, then you have some stones, and then you have the clouds at the at the top. So it's really it's a really well done piece. And so it will be congratulations both, of course, to, to this guy here who who got the uh, the tattoo, but but to you too because this is this is really good work. And I think maybe we'll we'll talk a little bit more about what this actually means and in the wider greater world so to speak but before we do that uh why don't we take a look at one more and and see what you have to say about that one all right ah cool okay so um uh, this is some more uh more recent work um and i i love this guy he's a bit of a joker uh and so what we've actually done here is we end up putting Raijin on the back and this design going as far back as we can, I would say this is kind of like a hoax side design. Um, but with the way I want to try and present my, my work, I feel that hoax size like brushwork, um, is a little too elegant for what I like. So I wanted to redraw this with more of that kind of Kumiyoshi uh, strength and simplicity kind of feel to it. Um, in this case, so one of the things that I'll kind of point out for anybody watching, uh, and I like, I feel really cool uh, talking to you about this. You're paying attention to my background, which is like super flattering. So thank you. But if you pay attention to like around like the buttocks area. Um, so the where it, it kind of starts spreading the Mikiti, um, you'll see a lot of similarities between this back tattoo and then that last one, the Jiraiya tattoo. And a lot of where I owe how that is designed is actually from studying a lot of Gifu Horihide's uh, older works. And Gifu Horihide had always been kind of coined as the person who said backgrounds are just as important, if not more important than means subject matter. Um, so in this case, one of the things that I've been playing around with more recently is kind of my secondaries. So 
what I mean by that is in this case, we're looking at, you know, how these leaves are kind of correlating with everything and how they're kind of adding a little splash of color. So where I have the lightning at the top, and there's a lot of that color playing around in there and a lot of the strength coming through color that way. This is why we're only really seeing the one leaf on the one shoulder blade. But as we get further down the uh, back tattoo here, we're not seeing any remnants of the lightning. And so what I'm doing to bring out more color and kind of spread it out more is by um, putting these leaves there and, uh, and just having more of them. Uh, this is a really like probably good indicator of what I mean when I talk about my different black inks that I use, my different sumi blacks that I use. So when we look at kind of like the backgrounds versus like the softer clouds that are like just underneath the main subject matter versus some of the different like softer shades that I use within the subject matter. So when we look at like in uh, kind of like the, the tie um, what ends up happening is this is like a purple black that I'm using versus, you know, looking at some of like the green blacks that I'm using in the backgrounds, um, depending on how I choose to wash out my shoe, I can get this like peachy tone, which you'll also see in some of the fabrics, um, stuff like that. If I wash it out, but use a little bit of water, I can get it really peachy versus if I wash it out with only water and like just a small little drop of gray wash and get kind of like this brownie old kind of tan look, which is what we're seeing in, you know, some of the bracelets and anklets here. Um, this is, uh, this has been a really fun piece to work on. I really, uh, love the shape of my customer's body. And so for this reason, I really wanted to exaggerate, uh, the taper that he has on his waist. Uh, in correlation to his broad shoulder blades and then kind of bringing the kitty that goes from uh, the ass down into the legs kind of trying to give it that roundness so that way it has more of kind of like a clothing look to it and really conforms to his body a lot better awesome and you know you, you might have noticed me uh, smiling forever for whoever's looking uh, because that, that that's just so clever and it's so awesome to, to hear and, and to see right you know here's London using sort of like the same inks, but then getting different shades, getting different colors, just based off of how he dilutes, if we want to use that word, the, the yeah. ink, right? So you see a lot of color in here, which is technically true, but it's like the same underlying ink, right? Which I think is, is very clever. And, and it goes back to the whole traditional Japanese tattoo, right? They didn't have many colors, right? And so kind of like going back to what you were saying about appreciating the the minutia about the the color hues and such right uh with with one color they could get so many shades of or, or so with one ink so many shades and so many different colors right and i think that's what we're seeing in in this one um, yeah. and you know w w one of the awesome things about traditional japanese tattooing is you can just sit here and you can if you really look at it right you can notice so many different things right at a glass you might think oh it's relatively simple but no when you sit down and you look at it right you can notice all these different technicalities and and nuances that, that london is kind of pointing out right whether it's you know the the placement of the of the um items or what i call it that right with the thunder like you mentioned and the the leaves at the bottom right and then the different shades or, or hues of the colors i i just think it's a really well done piece i love it obviously that's why i'm we're talking about it not right where i'm being a little selfish here I, I picked the ones i i liked um but this is really awesome wearing in fact actually this transitions really well to my next um question i'm gonna stop uh sharing here um you know you've won multiple like tattoo competitions and such because of your work and rightly so right because it's just awesome and so i'm just wondering like if you can share, like, I don't know, your experience, your thoughts about this whole exhibition and, and tattoo uh, competition and stuff. So, I miss, you know, careful cancel culture out there. Um, I miss exclusivity. 
I miss how underground tattooing used to be. Um, and what's cool is, you know, tattooing in Japan has really made me kind of feel nostalgic because I feel that the tattoo scene here reminds me a lot of when I first started tattooing. Uh, and there is still that undergroundness. You know, I remember tattooing in Japan when it was still illegal, you know, and having to be careful, you know, because the police, you know, they don't like tattoos. So you could be fully covered up. They could see the tiniest little tattoo and immediately. All right, we got to do a search on you, you know. Uh, I, I I love that about tattooing, and I still do, you know. Um, and so for me, like, I'm not going to sit here and sound like an old soul and cry about what used to be. Instead, I want to sit there and, and make it what it's going to be. And I want to give it to, you know, as many future generations as I can and try to hold on to it as best as I can. So when it comes to competing, like, I've been doing conventions, like, long before you've been doing La Body Tattoos. And problem is it's like super super inclusive and i feel that like nobody's really kind of paying attention to how beautiful this is and in it being a sense of artwork and i don't necessarily mean like oh look like i'm an artist and i make really great you know paintings and tattoos more along the, the artwork of what it is to have community and being within a smaller kind of subculture and so what happens is you know, I try to spend as little time on the internet as possible. I try to keep under a rock, keep, uh, try to keep like a little tiny light in a really big cave and only some people can see it. And then when it's time to show the rest of the world, that's when I go to conventions. Well, like, oh, here's all these people for me, like, it's cool. I want to sit there, I really do, and I want to relish in the fact that I, you know, maybe I can have an ego, like, oh, you know, I'm not terrible. But the thing is, is even going to conventions and trying to, you know, do competitions and stuff like that, that's not for me per se, and it's not necessarily for other people, like, you know, people who go to conventions. It's more for the people who sat there and, like, paid me a lot of money and sat through a lot of pain, and for them to be, like, proud because seeing that amount of like dedication towards one's own self is like super, super rare in modern era. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. It's super rare in modern era. And so going and doing competition says great. And it's cool that like I can win stuff, but ultimately like I, you know, they give you two awards when you win an award, they give you one for you and one for the person who has the tattoo. And they do that because without those two components, there there would be nothing and so for me i'm just uh you know i'm just a guy with a stick you know i'm just uh, an idiot with a machine and so without the people that i tattoo like it means nothing to me like i like i i have nothing i am nothing and so for me i just like seeing those people like super happy like even if they don't win like i love seeing when they walk around in their finto sheets and like you know they're walking around they all have like the same zodi you know I really like seeing them walk around proud because, you know, one bodysuit in person is, is like pretty rare. But when you see like 10 of them together and they all know each other, and they've all, you know, sat down and had dinner together and they've all brought each other coffee and wished each other good luck on their sessions. Like, it's really cool because there's that closeness and others, they really, they see that and they identify it as like cool because it's, it's real. But as bad as they want it, they realize that there's a price to pay and it's not necessarily in money. It's in dedication and commitment. And, you know, destroying one's own body to gain something new. And this is something that kind of takes away that consumerism that I feel tattooing has really become in the modern era. And so I like it because it just it lets these people Let's them kind of relish in the fact that they can, you know, they can have a little bit of ego. They they deserve it, you know, like they sound really good for it. And so I like doing that. I like meeting young tattooers. And I think it's cool too if like a young tattooer sees that I win and stuff and they're like, oh, you're so cool. I'm like my favorite and stuff. But it's cool because, you know, maybe I can tell them like, hey, this is like, this is what tattooing should be. This is what makes it magical. This is why like I fell in love with it. So please, like, 
keep this magic kind of alive. You know, one day I'll die for you. You know, so also, yeah, no, that's that's great, and uh, you know, it's also good to hear how you're so humble, so humble about it, really, right? And you're like, hey, you know, it's it takes two to, to tango, as they say, right? It takes two to really make this awesome work come to life, right? You, you might hear some other people and they're like, oh, I'm the, I'm the shit, so to speak, right? It's, it's all me, but then you're a little bit, you're, you're more humble, right? You're like, hey, it's, it's the two of us, right? Which at the end, that's, that's true. Um, actually that, that leads me to another question and it might be controversial, maybe nowadays, who knows? Um, but something that used to be more of a norm perhaps, or at least in the Japanese tattooing community anyway. Is the the Horishi keeping like a lifelong bond with with their clients, right? Maybe not with all of their clients, but at least with with, with some of their clients, right? I think nowadays some people still do that, right? You, you hear about some some big names and, and some other people that you don't hear about they they still do that, but some others, of course, they opt not to. And so I'm just wondering. I'm hearing about you know your clients hanging out and buying each other coffee, and you shared some pictures, and I saw them actually. Uh, sitting in front of each other right it looks like they were having fun just just talking and I, I thought that was awesome right and so i'm wondering what's your take on this whole horishi client relationship while you're doing the work and then after the work is done so i think what's really important and needs to be put on the table so i think the difference between a horishi making body suits and a tattooer you know making customers is Odishi, like you, you kind of have to spend a lot of time with each other and no matter what you have to develop a relationship. So like usually at first I might be a little pessimistic about some people. Like, I don't know, maybe, you know, they say like first impression is, is like important, but it's also important to remember that like if somebody comes across as an asshole, when you first meet them, you, like you don't want to tattoo that on them like you may want to but like you don't want to actually tattoo that on them and so you need to also find like positive things about them so that you can actually make the tattoo because you, you know ultimately you're not there for you the artist you're there for that person um so when we start thinking about making the tattoo and having a relationship Obviously, in the beginning, it's it's almost always the same kind of thing. There's that like little bit of worry, but it's also important, I think, for Horishi to have like you know bodysuit, whether it's finished or it's in progress or what have you, you know. But it's important for Horishi to also have this because if you don't, you don't know what you're putting the person through, and you also can't be like big brother in a sense to them and being like, hey, like by the way. When we work on your front, I'll warn you, you know, like the floating rate is really, really bad. But like, you're going to think in your head, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I have all these doubts, but you can do this. Um, you know, actually, I, I can explain there was a story and like, I, I probably shouldn't say this out loud because like, I'm certain it won't look good on you, but this is real solid truth here. Um, so there was a time where I was working on a back tattoo and my customer was having a really hard time with really bad, uh, basically a divorce. And he came in for one of his regular sessions. We were tattooing him twice a week and he came in and was in such a horrible mood. I was like, man, it's okay. Like, you're in a, you know, you're in a safe place. You know, you can talk as much shit as you want, you know, un unload all that, make sure you don't move, but you know, <laughs> whatever. And we weren't even doing like a really painful part of the tattoo, but because he was being a sulky Sally while he was getting tattooed, um, it was starting to affect how he was sitting. But my job is to go is if I know that you're trying to climb the top of the mountain, I have to just tell you like, Hey, I know that that next step is going to be rough, but fuck you, you have to take it. So anyhow, he kept trying to like push himself up and off the mats. And I kept telling him to stop doing that. And um, I remember like just thinking in my head, like, how am I going to get him to snap out of this? So I just like took my hand immediately as hard as I could, slapped his leg. And he just like, I said, stop moving. 
And he said, thank you. Now, usually you wouldn't do that to your customers. You wouldn't go and go out of your way to cause a quick scare, maybe even, dare I say, harm. But you're doing that because you have this joint effort, which is to make a bodysuit. And again, like I said, it takes hours and hours, a lot of time and a lot of commitment with each other. There's going to be days like, you know, I'm sure if you have a significant other, if, you, if you've been in a relationship, even with family members, you know, there's days where you're just like, fuck, I don't want to deal with you today. This is going to be for the tattooers. This is going to be for the customers. This is, we're human beings. We're going to have these days. But how you push past it is what keeps your relationship strong. How you move forward is what keeps your relationship strong. And so by the end, customer doesn't remember getting slapped on the leg. They just remember it took a lot of fucking effort, but they were able to do it. But then the other thing is too is when they meet other people, we have also done this. And I think it's important to meet other people. I think there's a beauty in having like a rivalry, but like, hey, we're a band of brothers. We can do this together. Like, this is so beautiful because I could sit there and give my advice all I want. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like when your parents tell you like, oh, you'll understand later. You'll understand later. And you don't give shit because they're your parents. But at least you'll listen to older brother a little bit. So if older brother's like, hey, when you get here, it's, you know, when you start doing your ribs or you start doing back in the knee, like, it's going to be real bad. But this is how I got to do it. You know? Then they start bonding and they start having tight relationships. And I think this is like so important. Now, do I sit here and charge extra for having these kinds of experiences? No, but it's because like, I believe tattoos, it doesn't matter who you get tattooed by, they're expensive. So the least you can do is really sit and hang on to the experience of getting this. And I don't think a bond can be made that strong without that much or that much doubt or that much overcoming and dedication. So for me, I think it's like super cool. I, I always loved looking at like those old photos, you know, you'd see all these like old Japanese guys sitting together having cigarettes, gambling. You know, yep. uh, and they're all hanging out while this guy's like tattooing, you know, what is she's carving, you know, I think that's like so cool. And, you know, it'd be the same as like how it would have been like 20 years ago, looking at like, uh, you know, American tattooing, looking at like these old kind of underground guys, everybody smoking cigarettes, talking shit, you know, like, you know, whatever. And so that's what kind of kept it cool and kind of kept it underground, kind of kept it inclusive as well was. You, you can't sit there like you can't with like a half sleep and sit there and tell someone who has a full body suit that like, yo, I get it. And I get that the back <laughs> of your knee really hurts. And you're like, well, I, this one spot on my deltoid is so bad. Like, cause they're going to look at you sideways and be like, shut up. You, you don't know. But somebody who has, you know, the back of their knee tattoo talking to somebody, you know, you know, cause they have got a body suit talking to somebody who's getting their back going. They're gonna be like, yeah, it's like pretty bad in around the tailbone and stuff, but like, hey, you're just hang strong. That's gonna be a strong bond. And so, I like, I'm just these guys tattooer. I'm just these guys carver. I'm so lucky that I get to at least pay witness to what they built, being that community. And like, again. I can sit there and say, like, do this, it's cool, talk with each other, get bring each other coffee, wish, wish each other luck. But no, they do that all on their own. And they're the ones that are teaching the next ones, teaching the next ones, and so on and so on and so on. And so the only reason why I'm able to have that is because of them. And so, like, I'm so blessed for that. So, and then doing this thing on both ends of the, the planet, like, that's so cool to tell somebody in Japan, like, you know, there's somebody in like Canada who's cheering you on. You've never met, but they're cheering you on and hope that they can meet you one day. Like, that shit's so cool. And if I had like, if I had opportunity to kind of do that, hey, you've got friends who's cheering you on while you're going to be in a world of pain today. Like, I only, like, I only have that because of those people. And so, like, 
community again is I can sit there all I want, but I'm not the boss of these guys. I'm just their tattooer. And so again, like super, super happy and super lucky and grateful that I have those people. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, I get the same feeling. Uh, I could even do a little plug for for something I'm working on, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that in here. But you know, some of the stuff I'm doing uh, behind the scenes or, or in the dark, I've also been able to appreciate just the, the traditional Japanese tattooing community, just how strong it is, how how supportive it is, right? And and like you said, you you don't get there without going through the same struggles and and hardships, right? Which in this case is it's the tattooing, right? So no, that's it's, that's really really cool to to hear. And also, I thought that was pretty cool how how you mentioned, you know, you're talking to someone in Japan, and hey, there's someone in Canada just to, rooting for you, right? And you know that's true, and that's that's really cool to just to, just to think about, right? Um, how this makes us, you know, this whole tattooing journey connects us in so many ways all throughout the world, right? I think that's that's pretty yeah. awesome. All right, so the Suigoden novel has had a huge impact on the world of, of tattooing and, and beyond, right? Tattooing, OPOA, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm just wondering, you know, we talked about outlaws, we talked about the sort of, we didn't really say the word vigilante, but sort of like vigilante uh, justice type of deal. And I'm just curious if you have like a favorite outlaw or like a favorite scene in, in Suigoden. Okay, yeah, so... That's very easy, and uh, glad I got to be the first to answer this one. Um, so first off, it's definitely Chojin is my favorite character. Um, so my like my favorite thing about Chojin is his very like I don't give a fuck, get things done attitude. Um, ends up being his downfall as well. But I think one of the coolest parts of just like that really kind of resonated with me was um, so you have the boss of the suit court, you know, you have the main guy um, and he gets, he gets really sick, really ill. And, you know, there are a bunch of bandits basically. So, you know, he's in need of medical attention. And so they find out basically, you know, I'm, I'm putting this in layman's terms here. Um, but they, you know, they find like a black market kind of doctor essentially. Um, like you know Chojin goes to this doctor and he's like hey you know my boss needs medical attention he needs your help you know it's life and death kind of thing but the thing is is the doctor's having like an affair with a prostitute and he explains to the prostitute like hey I might need to go with these guys you know is that going to be cool she basically says like you leave with these guys like we're done so the doctor goes back to Chojin and says his predicament is basically like, hey, listen, um, I'm, I'm having a real tough time making this decision because if I go with you, like, she's going to leave me. So Chojin goes out of his way, kills the prostitute, goes back to the doctor and basically goes, well, the decision's been made. And I think like that's such a cool little little bit to children like you know we could say here we could talk about you know reincarnation being brought into his brother and all that but i think just that story alone kind of really pegs that character very well because here's this desire to you know do his part to help his boss out but there's that like strong headedness that like just doesn't give a fuck and needs to get things done and I think that's what makes that character, like, truthfully, in my opinion, the coolest character of the Sui Koden story. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I you know, if, if you ask me, it, it's hard to pick because they're all, they're so, like, unfiltered, I guess that's the way to put them, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. they, they want to do something, and they're like, fuck you, I'll kill you, I'll do whatever I need to do to just get whatever yeah. I want. And and that's just, obviously, I think most people won't be able to do that in the real world, so it's... Oh, you know, no, yeah. So I release to see that in whether it's a book or, or a show or a movie or, or whatever it might be. Awesome. So I know we've been we've been talking here for quite a bit. It's been a it's been a pleasure so far. I guess I'll I'll ask one more question and then I'll open it up to you if, if there's anything you want to talk about. Of course, feel free. But you know we've talked about how you know you've traveled all around the world, you've won awards, 
it sounds dramatic, but you've impacted the lives of a lot of people with your work, right? Not just from the people that are wearing the stuff, but I think I could argue that the people looking at the work are also impacted, right? It's, it's a feast for the eyes, uh, so to speak. I, I certainly enjoy it. And so my question for you is, so what's next for Long This Lane? You know, I don't know. Um, I think what it is, is I'm just happy knowing that, um, you know, tomorrow I get to do this again. Um, I think the ultimate ideal is, is you got to, you got to pay it back to the first guy, the first guy who ends up getting, you know, his back tattoo, turns into a body. You pay it back to him because that, that's like, that's the one that kind of helped make you like, you know, a dream. And so for me, I don't know, I'm like, let's make it so that, you know, people in Uganda know that like my crew's the coolest crew, you know, let's make it so, you know, people in Australia, you know, like my crew, my crew is the coolest crew, you know, um, talking about like street coding and stuff like that. Yeah. Like my band of, you know, tattoo fucking hooligans are the coolest. <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> so yeah, at the end of the day, it's just not more tattooing and just trying to improve daily and just, you know, do cooler shit really, uh, you know, just try to make it so it's not history anymore. It's like modern, not modern as in new, you're just keeping it alive, you know? So yeah, that's, that's basically it. Yeah. Have fun and, you know, keep stabbing away at people. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's, that's super awesome to hear, you know, when, in fact, from, from my perspective right that's also what i'm trying to do uh just just keeping wabori alive right bringing it to the to the west sort of so to speak right um it's it's very differently perceived in in japan versus in the west but i do think that the more the west appreciates uh wabori right the more the japanese people themselves will be like oh well this is actually acceptable and this is actually great right and they'll be able to actually appreciate it themselves uh more right um so that's awesome you know I'm, I'm i'm super happy that i got to sit down here with you i you know i'm not being dramatic when i say that i, I don't think there's any other interview written much less in video or, or audio format that that goes into such depth and and content as, as we've talked about like today it's like i think it's one of the first like really thorough insightful interviews on, on traditional Japanese tattooing I've, I've ever seen, even though I'm of course recording it myself, but I think it's going to be really awesome for, for the people that are going to be watching it or, or hearing it. I know there's a lot of demand, right? I think it's, it's been proven already and I'm just super grateful for you really sitting down here second time, right? I, I mentioned at the beginning that you were the first for the Instagram, the Wabodipedia Instagram, uh, written interview and here you are again for for the actual video slash audio uh round and it's just i'm just so grateful for you i, I really love your obviously your work right it's just speaks for itself and then your, your positive vibes man i think that's that's one of the things i like best about you right some people can be good at something but they're like total dicks assholes and you know it's like you know yeah you can appreciate it but it's like you know fuck that guy but then here you are you're like a nice you're you're, you're actually sending you know nice positive vibes i, I really love that um, there are not pe not many people uh, like that. So thank you, thank you very much for for really for taking the time. You, yeah, I think ultimately, honestly, we project to others as they project on us, and vice versa, right? And I've always just said, like, I probably already have said it, but I'm just a mirror of the people I tattoo. Um, just that guy. So if if like it seems like I'm cool, it's because my guys. They, they taught me how to be you know, less of an asshole and maybe more of a nice guy, I guess. Cool. Awesome. All right. I know we're, we're up the close here, uh, but I'll open up to you. If there's anything you want to share, anything you want to talk about, feel free to, to bring it up. Is there a random thing you want to know? I don't know. Some random stuff. Any any shout out, anything you're, you're going to be doing? I don't know. Uh, London's oh. coming up with whatever, you know. But if I was going to shout out to anybody, one, I have to thank a very good friend of mine, 
uh, who I think everybody in tattooing needs to thank, at least uh, in Canada and America, which is uh, the legend Cycle Dave. I owe Cycle Dave a lot to why I'm able to be who I am today. I wished him a happy birthday just the other day and saying to him, hey, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, I owe a lot to every artist uh, that I've ever met, especially uh, in Gifu. Uh, I owe a lot to that history. Um, I'll, I owe a lot to, uh, you know, shout out to Peiko at Gentle Ink. Uh, shout out to everybody here at Gentle Ink. It's been very welcoming to me. It's been great watching some of even the newer guys grow. I mentioned uh, Gone earlier. Uh, feel free to check him out, Mr. Gone, on Instagram. Um, but, I mean, ultimately, yeah, if I was going to say anything to anyone, like, if you're into Japanese tattoos, at least come out here and visit. Um, there's a lot to learn um, that is just so ingrained in the culture that even just walking around and keeping your eyes open will really teach you about how to make, you know, how to make as if, you know, your art was Japanese. I think that's the most important thing. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. And if you make a Japanese tattoos, you know, try to think with that, you know, that fighting spirit, um, because that's what's really going to uh, try and project it positively for us. Awesome. All right, and where can people, you know, find you, connect with you? Um, okay, so on Instagram, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, you just look up at London Slade. Um, that's Slade with a D, not V. That's, you know, the big one everybody seems to hear. Um, you can find me, I don't know, wherever Carmen San Diego is. Um, so sometimes I'm here in Japan and sometimes I'm in Canada. Um but yeah, I would say if you look me up on Instagram, feel free. Worst you're going to have to do is just wait for a tattoo. But uh, yeah, and all there, you know, my booking info is all there, all that stuff. So, you know, please feel free. Check me out, everyone. Awesome. At long this late, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for your time and wish you a very, very successful career and in, in life. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, never mind my I'm excited to see who else comes on to this. So thank you very much for doing what you're doing. If you would like to learn more about the world of traditional Japanese tattooing, follow the Waburipedia Instagram page, hit like and subscribe in the YouTube and Spotify channels, and stay tuned for the meanings and stories behind Japanese tattooing, Horishi interviews, and more.